We welcome and greet all of you in the name of Christ. Also those who are with us by means of live stream, we pray that we'll have a good fellowship tonight. This will be our ninth lesson in the book of Amos. We commence the second chapter tonight. <coughs> is it really, as the church is warned, a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God? Amen. Is it? Is God really a consuming fire? Is he, as is proclaimed to the body of Christ? Are we, are we really to take seriously the words of Jesus, I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear? Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Amen. Are these really for people today? And if they are, why aren't they being said? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why aren't people being told this? Yeah. If this is for the, yes. for the people, if we're in proper necessities, or is it that Jesus said something that doesn't apply to everybody? I think any person of sound mind will take these things seriously, not take them lightly. Amen. Now to confirm to our hearts that these are needful sayings, God is stamped into history various demonstrations that what we just read is true. God will not overlook people that tamper with Him and pretend and aren't serious. <laughs> I'm sorry, to, I'd like to try to be able to say this really nice and soft and sweet, but I can't. This is dangerous stuff. God is not speaking in figures and types and hyperboles when he talks about fearing them. Amen. When I say fear, I mean tremble. Yes. Uh -huh. I mean you're scared to offend God. Amen. Amen. Frightens you to think about it. And if it doesn't, well, you just don't have the fear of God. That's all. Just as well, just as well come right out and say it. Don't provoke God. Amen. If you're tempted to provoke God, how are you tempted to provoke God? By ignoring Him and acting as though what He said about fear isn't really pertinent and acting as though He has He has such a deep love for you, He's willing to overlook some of the nonsense that you do. And it's just, Don't provoke God. Are we stronger than we? Paul says. Now God's to be praised. <laughs> that we don't have to learn these things the hard way. Uh, you can't learn them the hard way. I mean, I, But this is not the preferred <laughs> method of learning. Amen. You can learn from the experiences of other people Amen. that are recorded who lived in lesser light. And if these things happen in lesser light, well, what do you suppose will happen in greater light? Huh? Although we're not saved by works, we understand that, at least we should understand that, yet our works do have a calculating effect upon God. In fact, all these denunciations we're reading about in Amos was because of what people did. It's <laughs> because of what they did. When, when Jesus addressed the churches in Asia and I rebuked some of them, it's because of what they did. Their works said, your works aren't perfect. You tell them. Yeah. Tell them, no one's works is perfect. This is not the way you reply to Jesus. When Jesus says your works aren't perfect, you don't spout back nobody is perfect. Amen. 
Only a fool answers Jesus like this. But that's how people do it. That's how they talk. Which means they're fools. Is why they talk that way. So our works have to at some point got to line up. That's what these texts are teaching us. If not, God will judge us. That's, that's, that's the way it is. And if someone says any different, they just haven't told the truth. That's the way it is. God doesn't delight in judging his people harshly. He doesn't. But he will do this. He will do this. So he warns us about it. Furthermore, these judgments we read about, which some of them were pretty pretty hard. They were, they were not nice little convenient judgments. <laughs> like blotting the name out, blotting the nation out, burning a city up, destroying the people, taking them captive. I mean, these were, <laughs> these were come so hard judgments, but God was not acting out of character Amen. when he did this. <laughs> Jesus confirmed this when he announced to Jerusalem that they would be judged because they didn't recognize their day of visitation. You didn't know the day of visitation. And if you want to let your hair like stand on end, you hunt up and you'll be able to find it, some records of the destruction of Jerusalem and what went on there and it'll stand your hair on end. You haven't seen anything yet. You talk about the Vietnamese and people like this, the Viet Cong. You read some of the accounts of the destruction of Jerusalem and it'll make you weep. You have no idea how cruel people can be. And when you tamper with God and Christ, he'll turn you over to those people. That's what he's done. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Doesn't seem fair? Is it fair that a person should be lukewarm toward the God that redeemed them? Is this fair that a person should be indifferent toward the Christ that purchased them? Is this fair? No. She had been kind of a distorted sense of values. So that's why this, this book is good, along with others that are like this. The alert people. This message is for people who spurn the gospel or who embrace it, then go back to wallowing in the mire. This is the kind of message we got for him. Yeah. Not a pleasant one. Really yes. Going back to what you're talking about, how God, how um, he'll turn us, he'll turn the people who tamper with him over to these wicked people. As concerning even the world, if a man does some, if he commits a, a crime, then the judge will judge him. And if the judge lets him go, even though he committed this crime, he will be accused of being a false judge. Yeah. But he has to be punished. Mm -hmm. That's right. Remember, Jesus talked about being delivered to the tormentors. You remember that? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus said this. To be, try and avoid being delivered to the tormentors. And they were real tormentors. Yeah. So you don't want to be turned over to those kind of people. Jerusalem was, Israel was, sometimes for 40 years, sometimes for 40 years it'd be oppressed by a heathen nation. For 40 years, four decades. Can you imagine something like that? And, well, that's happened in history, but yet they're written for our learning about whom the ends of the world are come. Here's our text. to be the first three verses of chapter 2. Word to Moab. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kerioth, and Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting, and with the sound of a trumpet, and I will cut off the judge from the midst thereof, and will, not, and will slay all the princes thereof with him saith the Lord. <coughs> Moab stands for the people, the whole nation of Moab, the Moabites. Just that one word stands for all the people, like we would say Americans. That's the, we use words like that too. 
Well, when Sodom was the, the land of Moab, was developed by the offspring of Lot through his oldest daughter. Lot took up residence in Zoar, you remember? And he was spared from the Holocaust. Zoar was slated for destruction. Yeah. But God ex excluded it because Lot was there. And then they begin to spread out toward the east side of the Dead Sea and became a kind of a vast nation. Ruth, the great grandmother of David, she was a Moabitess. Not your run of the mill Moabitess either. either. <laughs> the descendants of Lot through the daughter through his daughters were the Ammonites and the Moabites. Both as a total, to, totally, both of them were cursed. <laughs> it's that's. A, wasn't too wise of a decision the girls made. There wasn't lost decision, is it? It was the girls' decision. Right. Wasn't too good of a decision. They're also like a thorn in Israel's Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, Moses said, now Moabites and Ammonites cannot enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Amen. So what about Ruth? Well, she, she adopted the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. So she was allowed entrance. And there's given two reasons for this to happen. And two, there was two, two reasons are given for the Moabites and the Ammonites being cut off. One, they didn't meet Israel's bread and water when they came out of Egypt. That's hundreds of years. That's hundreds, hundreds of years before this. Here come Israel out of Egypt, and the Ammonites and Moabites, the Moabites particularly, didn't give them bread and water. So you can't force somebody to do something like that. Well, you better better rethink that. If there's someone that needs sustenance and you didn't give it to them, better take serious account of this record here. Yes. More so spiritually. <laughs> oh yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, what spiritual is graduated? This is a, this was physical. And if it's true there, it's multiplied many times in the, in the spirit. And the second reason was because they hired Balaam to curse Israel. Well, actually, it was just, it was just the king. It wasn't the people, but it, either what the king did represented all the people. For those two reasons, they didn't give bread and water to Israel, and they hired Balaam to curse Israel. And for these things, Amos now pronounces judgment against them. Then we come across this phrase again, three transgressions and four. It's the fifth time this phrase has been used. Damascus, and at each time there weren't three and four incidents cited. It was one, maybe two incidents cited. It was just three, yet four transgressions for for Damascus, it was because they threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. They were, they were cruel, unduly cruel. Against uh, Gaza, it was because they carried away captive the whole captivity to Edom and remembered not the brotherly covenant. So they took Israelites and sold them to the Edomites as slaves. For Tyrus, it was because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and remembered not the brotherly covenant. They forgot the agreement. So I'm saying it's because they're not three, not four. He says, for three, yea, four. For Edom, it was because they did pursue his brother with the sword, cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. So he just is a burning tinderbox all the time. For Ammon, it was because they ripped up the women with children, with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. Yet these sins, though singular and possibly double, are called three, yet four. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because the weight of them were equal to three or four other transgressions. Yes? Please. Uh, and Moses warned Israel that if their transgressions got to a certain point, God would punish them seven times. Seven times, that's right. 
So this is the way heaven views yeah. certain things. Mm -hmm. See, all sin is not the same. Right. And people that say so are, are they're simpletons. Yeah. They, they, they have no right to talk. I'm serious. People like this have no right, free speech or not, they have no right to talk. They fill the air with a lot of noise, distracting noise. There are sins that are so large that one of them equals four of any other. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You, you see the reason why he yeah. talks this way? It's important to pick up on this. Three yet four. God considers him the same as three or four major acts of rebellion. <laughs> that, of course, meant that God's long suffering was like three or four times longer. The fact that, that he endured these sins was equal to enduring three or four massive sins. See, so the long suffering of God was extended, and the magnitude of the sin is extended. And God, <laughs> he tells them what he told the others, I'll not, <clears throat> I'll not turn away. I'm making this announcement because now my decision is cast in stone. Yeah. There comes a time when God's decision cast in stone. For what, what, what caused this, Lord? Why, why did you take this stance against Moab? What did they do? Well, they burned the bones of the king of Edom. Burn the bones of the king of Edom? Well, Lord, this is all right in the 20th century. We have a regular practice of doing this. <laughs> Why our churches, they promote cremation, Lord. Are you sure? Is this, did the translators like miss it here? Is this some kind of interpolation by a scribe that stuck this in there? Because, Lord, this has become fashionable to burn bones. No, the Lord says, no. I'm doing this because they burn the bones of the king of Edom. You say, well, that must be some spiritual significance. No, they burn the bones of the king of Edom. Now, the actual historical account of this isn't in the scripture. So now you got a, a person is tested with whether to believe it because God said it or want a little bit of further evidence that this is really what he meant. See? So it's a test of scripture. You remember Israel, they didn't think this way. They buried the bones of Joseph. Yes, that's right. They buried his bones when they got into Canaan. Amen. They buried the bones of Joseph which the children of Israel brought out of Egypt. Yeah. They didn't bring a whole body. They brought the bones out. They buried him. When King Saul was dead... The Philistines took his armor and put in the house of their god Ashtaroth. And then they fastened his body in the, to the wall of their city. <coughs> and when the inhabitants heard what the Philistines had done with Saul, they come and took the body of Saul and his sons off the wall. They burned the rotted flesh and they buried their bones. As yeah. found in 1 Samuel 31. This mentioned in 2 Samuel 21. There was also a case where God <laughs> prophesied, saying a king named Josiah was going to burn some bones on an altar. And this was like human bones. This was like. <laughs> Very unusual. The scriptures say that Josiah did. He, he found the sepulchers of the false prophets next to one of their altars, and he had them dig up the bones of the false prophets from these sepulchers, and he took those bones and burned them up on the altar. Here's how the scripture said it. Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it. <coughs> According to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. 
I'm showing you burning bones. Whatever men may think about it, this is serious business with God. So you've been toying with the idea of cremation. Quit fooling around with it. It's like stop it tonight. Yeah. Purge your mind of it. Yes. If you're getting ready to die now, the funeral director is going to come over and give you this alternative. Yeah. It's going to be cheaper. You wow. can do it by half price. Burn the body for half price. Yeah. But you may go to hell in the process. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's just not worth it. No. I made accent in this because in our day, 40 years ago, we didn't have to talk like this. Yeah. But today there's been such a modification of the Christian community that the majority of church members do not know that cremation is not right. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know it. Mm -hmm. There's some pretty hot arguments about it too, not, or not so hot. <coughs> Why is it this way? <coughs> because the body is intended, when you die, the body is intended to decay in the grave. Mm -hmm. Death finishes its work in the grave, yeah. wow. not in the furnace. Yeah. Amen. That's why. Why? Because God's going to raise the bodies out of the grave. You say, what have they been burned? He's going to raise them up anyway. But yeah. the, the intended, mm -hmm. in the grave, the graves are going to be opened. Well, yeah. some people's ashes are scattered upon the ocean, so they're... He'll, he'll put it together. I understand that. Well, you, you want to bank on the standard mode, which is burial, where it says death is intended to finish its work in the grave. Go grave, where is thy victory? Uh -huh. You burn the bones, the grave doesn't have any victory. Uh -huh. See? Furnace has a victory. Yeah. We actually, yeah. we bury That's the right. body like a seed. That's right. Because, Plant. you know, like Jesus said, except a seed fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. That's well, right. That's that's true of Jesus. It's yeah. also true of the greater resurrection. So yeah. we bury the body as a seed in hope of resurrection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see that this is why it's wrong to burn the bones. Yeah. This, why, this is why God... Mm -hmm. God intends that you associate the resurrection with the grave. Yes. Like you mentioned Joseph, he was doing the same thing. He was not anticipating staying in Egypt. He was he said, "Take my bones out That's of here." That's right. Mm -hmm. See what what happens to your body after you die. Some people say, "What's the difference? What's the difference? The body's going to be raised. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. It's sown in hope. Yes, amen. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. No one has a right." to destroy the body by artificial means. No one has that. Some people do this, we don't deny it. There's, that there's accidents where this happens, we don't deny. But it's not to be an intentional thing. Yes. Paul did say, the body's for the Lord and the Lord's for, for the, the body. body. That's right. That certainly is not confined just to mm -hmm. the present time. Death right. belongs to God as well. Amen. See, Pete, some people, they don't like funerals. Mm. I knew people that wouldn't let their children go to funerals. Didn't want them to see death. Our children went to every funeral there was around that we had the chance to go to. Why? Because we wanted them to become familiar. Not only with death, but with how Christians conduct themselves in the face of death. As a little boy, I have still got memories that are impressed indelibly upon my memory of I was just like five years old, seeing saints march around caskets, singing, I'll meet you in the morning. I remember things like this. I remember standing in an old frigid territory when you buried a body and some preacher talking about the resurrection of the dead and the body's going to come up out of here. I remember things like that. See, some children, they're, they're all that's hidden from them. God has his types. It's very important to him. Right. And like right. keep sacred and keep your hands off. Death, burial, and resurrection is one of those. Uh -huh. yeah, that's right. If, yeah. if we had lost that a long, long time ago, but you know, before Christ or at that time, it would have been hard to teach some of the things that was important to teach. That's why it was, this, all this was established. Amen. Every, yeah. every, uh, there was a lot of them too. Deaths while we're at, at, uh, at the, in Oklahoma. And every one of them, 
with cremation. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. That's a big thing. Yeah. They didn't know this. These people don't know that this text we just read is in the Bible. Yeah. But it is there. Yeah. Yes, it does. It. Our Lord was buried in a grave. He was buried. Yeah. Yeah. And God himself buried Moses. That's right. Now, if anybody could burn him up, it'd be God. He, he himself buried Moses, and part of the gospel is the burial of Christ. Uh -huh. Is there any favorable reference to creation in Scripture? Any at all? No, I don't believe so. I, I, so I made a concerted effort to find one, no. Yeah. That, as it's I said, always associated with something. And people that were burned up, yeah. like Nadab and Abihu, it was a curse. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Not a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is, this is why now, because they burned the bones of the king of, not the king of Israel, the king of Edom. Yeah. Uh -huh. I say e Esau's offspring. Yeah. They burned the bones yeah. of the king of Edom. And so because they did that, I will send a fire upon Moab. All right, that's the fifth time God said he's going to send fire on somebody. <coughs> he will initiate a destruction by fire to those who burn bones. It's, it's an interesting parallel. In the end of the world, the world and all that's in it will be burned up by fire. See? The Spirit teaches us that this fire will destroy the Lord's adversaries. See, but if you burn bones, these all these texts they kind of the edge is knocked off of them. They're not they're not as serious as they would be otherwise. But the heavens and earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the judgment, day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Then Hebrews 10, 26, If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There, there's a sin Jesus didn't die for. Yeah. I don't know what else that means if it doesn't mean that. No sacrifice for sin, that sin. So does that means it never has forgiveness? Well, I just advise that you don't commit it. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. See, so when it comes to destruction by fire, Men do the, they do employ this methodology, but they do greatly err in doing it. Because this mars the power of these texts. It says God's going to destroy the world by fire. He's going to destroy his adversaries by fire. And so this is something you don't want to cloud this by dabbling in it yourself. You, you don't want to do this. There have been rebels in history that didn't think this was possible. They didn't think God was like this. Like Pharaoh, for instance, he said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I, I know not the Lord. I'm not going to obey him. Sennacherib said to Hosea, uh, said to Hezekiah, Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people out of my hand, that your God should be able to deliver you out of my hand? See, did, they didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know God's a destroying God. They didn't know this. They thought the God of Israel was just like the gods of other lands. But he's not like the gods of other lands. God's fire is focused. It's not like a, a blaze that rages out of control. See, it's focused. He said, I'll send a fire on the house of Hazel. I'll send a fire on the wall of Gaza. See how focused it is? I'll send a fire on the wall of Tyrus. I'll send a fire on Timon. T -Timon. And I'll send a fire on Moab. See how it's more like a, like a, laser, like a man sending a laser beam. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's more like that. On one occasion, the fire of God fell on two wicked men, Nadab and Abihu, standing before the tabernacle. That's pretty, pretty focused. 
didn't burn up the tabernacle, didn't burn up anything else, just yeah. right on them. Another time a uh, fire consumed them, they're on the uttermost part of the camp. Those that are on the edge of the camp out there, fire got sent a fire and destroyed all the all the people on the edge. <laughs> I say God sent a fire and destroyed all the people on the edge. <laughs> Don't be lagging behind. This is not place. This is not the place to be, Amen. on the edge of the camp, out there where you're closer to the world yard. No, this is not the place to be, at all. Another time, he consumed 250 men, rebellious priests, who didn't like Aaron being the high priest. See, so his focus, his focus. God's judgments are not general, and we. We Christians, as much as possible, should refrain from speaking in generalities. We should learn to speak precisely, not in generalities, because as soon as men begin to think general, they get sloppy. It's just how man is. God loves us all. You know, see, but those generalities tend to lull people to sleep. So speaking more specifics. And I'll devour the palaces of Kerioth. That was a, a, a royal and capital city. Jeremiah pronounced God's judgments against Kerioth in Jeremiah 48. It was considered a strong and a loyal and royal city. Both reputation and appearance, however, would be destroyed. And I'll burn up the palaces of Kerioth. I'm going to, it's not going to be like it was before. Not, when I judge it, it's not going to be like it was before. And Moab shall die with tumult. Other versions say die amid tumult. The NIV says we'll go down in great tumult or amid an uproar, New Revised Standard Version. Death will come on Moab with noise, basic Bible. Moab shall perish in weakness, Septuagint. Perish in the heat of battle. What, 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 what does all that mean? Now the soldiers of Moab were known for their fierceness. Moses refers to the mighty men of Moab. See, they were known for. Isaiah wrote of the armed soldiers of Moab. They were known for their fierceness. He also wrote of Moab. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He's very proud, even his, of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath. But his lies shall not be so. Jeremiah referred to them as the tumultuous ones. All right, the sense of the text is, Moab was a tumultuous, noise-making, fire-breathing. They were going to be destroyed while they were breathing fire and making noise. And while they were at the peak of their strength, God's going to squash them in tumult. In their tumult. See, their tumult's not going to... Their, their aggressiveness is not going to be able to save them. They're going to be as aggressive as anybody ever been. But they're going to uh, go down in defeat. It's kind of like the judgment of, uh, against Egypt. That's while right. they were in pursuit. That's right. Mm -hmm. We'll find some instances of this. Mm -hmm. The shouting and the trumpet sound, the shouting and sound of the trumpet will come from their enemies. They'll be shouting, making a bunch of noise like they usually did when they won battles. But they're just going to, then over and above that, they're going to hear the sound of a trumpet and shout, and the enemy is going to triumph over them. <clears throat> now, this is the Lord's manner to bring his enemies down when they are at the peak of their strength. This, now, this is a divine manner. Amen. Not while they're in a weakened state. Man's methodology is wait till they're in a weakened state and bring them down. But that's not that's not how God operates. God brings them down to strong state. Egypt was overthrown by God at the peak of its strength, as Brother Ricky mentioned. That's when it was brought down. Sion and his armies and Og and his armies were decimated when they were at the peak of their strength. 
The same was true of Goliath. He was destroyed when he had all his armor on. Yeah. Huh? He had all his armor on. He was destroyed at the peak of his strength. The king of Babylon came down at the peak of its strength. Belshazzar was stripped of his kingdom when he was at the peak of his strength. Sennacherib and his army went down in bitter defeat when they were at the peak of their strength with a string of successful battles. The devil was defeated by Jesus at the peak. Yes, amen. <laughs> this is the peak of his strength. Uh -huh. yeah. There he is, a hammering away at the Lord Jesus. It looks like he's the victor. It looks like he's he's the great bruiser. But at that point, Jesus brought him down. Amen. The weakness of God is stronger than that's right. Yeah. And the principalities and powers was the same thing. The principalities and powers at the peak of their strength, like you see the whole world had the whole world kept Jesus brought them down at the peak of their strength. Yeah, Judah. You said exactly what I was just getting ready to say, that the devil at his peak was destroyed when Jesus was at his low. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It didn't it didn't take Jesus a lot because he defeated him when he was in his most lowly state. This is God's manner. But see now, you have to learn to like work with this kind of knowledge. So your enemies are getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, they are picking up strength and they have more influence. And our hope's got to wake up and say, well, wait a minute now, this is the time that God's probably going to bring them down. Amen. you got to learn to reason with this, this kind of information. So it should not surprise us when our enemies appear to have the upper hand and seem to be growing in power. God will let them proceed until they get to a point where there'll be no question. When God brings them down, there'll be no question who was superior. They'll fall under the weight of the divine will. See, God is so powerful, He just has to will that they fall and they fall. That's how strong God is. Yes. Would it be to say that he promised us at the Tower of Babel, and he said that uh, he said, "Behold, the people are one, and they have yeah, all one language." Yeah, that's right. Would it be accurate to say that he promised that at that time? That's that this an would example. It was at that point they were brought down, mm -hmm. and he said nothing will be restrained from them that they imagined to do. Remember? That was their peak. He brought them down. This is how God operates. I see this changes the the way you think. When, it, when you know this and you grasp this, because sometimes it looks like the enemy is gaining the upper hand. They gradually, they're gaining the upper hand, but then this is when God brings them down is when they got it. At least 185,000 right. outside the walls of Jerusalem. Amen. We don't know how many others, mm -hmm. but those stayed there. Yeah, they stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't wake, they went to sleep, but they didn't wake yeah, up. That's right. They yeah. woke up in another place. Another place. <laughs> I will cut off, this is a judgment now, for burning the bones of Edom. I will cut off the judge to the midst thereof and will slay all the princes thereof with him. Uh, here's another principle that we see that when God cuts off the people, he takes their king down with him and their princes down with him and their priests or their gods down with him. He, he brings the whole thing. He doesn't bring the people down and leave the king standing. That's not what God does. He said earlier in this uh, passage that he'd, hold, he'd cut off him that holdeth the scepter. See, when he, when he cut off the people, king came down yeah. with him. He did the same at Gaza, cut off him that had the scepter. The palaces of Tyrus were included in his judgment, as well as the palaces of Edom. When God judged Ammon, their king went into captivity. So, last verse of Amos 1. See, this is God's manner now. He cuts off the leader when he cuts off the lesser. Yes. As you were talking, you said, I considered um, when the tornado hit our house, 
the reason, the main reason why we couldn't live it anymore is because it destroyed the foundation. It hit yeah. the foundation, yes. so the structure was unstable. That's right. Mm -hmm. Just like this, he took down the leader, and mm -hmm. the people were unstable, and the leader. That's right. They couldn't yeah. rebuild. That's so, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you if kept the leader alive, the prince is alive, then they could re rejuvenate. But he took him down, and this applied. You want to be able to apply this to Satan and his and his host. <clears throat> now he says to uh, Moab, "I'm going to cut off the judge." He doesn't say king here, Silas. Moving back, whenever Annie was talking about how. Whenever you start at the bottom, then everything falls down. I thought about whenever King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about the statue. Yeah. The rock cut out of the mountains, hit the bottom of the structure, and the whole thing came down. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I, I, want to throw, I can't wait to throw this in. When God forgives your sin, he cuts the king off too. Yeah. Uh, Amen. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. When he takes your sin away, he takes the one who fomented the sin away too. Yeah. That's right. See, some of us didn't know this for a long time. Yeah. It's not. It's really not general knowledge, yeah. but it, this is the truth. Yeah. Sin can't be remitted without the instigator of sin being overthrown. Yeah. Together with all of his princes, <laughs> I cut off the judge. He, you know, he doesn't mention king. He doesn't mention prince. Judge. Some of the translations translate this king and ruler, but this is not a proper translation. The word judge is not a synonym for king. The scriptures speak of the judges of the earth. Several places I listen there for you. Now, a king accents authority. A judge accesses wisdom and discretion. So to take away the judge is to remove the right to make an official decision or an official appraisal. God's going to destroy the people who made decisions and saw issues. You're going to destroy them. See, Satan works through people that see advantages for the wicked one in circumstances. When your sins are forgiven and you're justified and reconciled to God, some of Satan's lieutenants, they can see things in your life that they can work with, they're overthrown. <laughs> oh, that's a piece of good news, I'll tell you, because you don't have any power over them yourself. God has set himself forth as one that can raise up kings and leaders. Let me rephrase that. That does raise up kings and leaders and puts them down. <clears throat> Daniel said, Daniel 2.21, he removes kings and sets up kings. Yeah. Yeah. What about presidents? Same thing. Amen. He removes them. Mm. He sets them up. Yeah. See, so you mean he set up the one we got? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Because yeah, that's, right. yeah. that's what the people wanted. Yeah. 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 I don't think it's what the people wanted. We know it's what they wanted because this is our form of government. Yeah. People who are wanted get in. Mm -hmm. It was others they cheat. Well, so they still get in, but what the people wanted. Yes. When the people first asked for a king, and they did get what they wanted. They got Saul. Yeah. And they got what they wanted. That's right. Yeah. Again, he says, "The Most High rules in the kingdom of man, and giveth it to whomsoever he will." Setteth up over it the basis of it. He can put a scoundrel over it if he wants. Now yeah, we, we should know something about that. The psalmist said, Psalm 75, 6, Promotion cometh neither from the east or from the west or from the south, but, the, but God is judge. He puts down one and sets up another. So what am I going to do with Moab? I'm going to put down their judge. Yes. 
This is involved in the kingdom belonging to God and being the governor among the nations, as he's called. Again, it's written, God is the king over all the earth and reigneth over the heathen. Over the heathen? Over the Muslims? The Shinduists? Yes. He reigns over them. Amen. Amen. We shouldn't we shouldn't be fearing these other. Yes. We shouldn't be fearing these others. That's right. We should be fearing God yes. who is Amen. over yes. these others. In our time, this is how men regard, this is not how men regard the God of heaven. They think the ballot box rules. No. The ballot box does not rule and the chambers of the Senate don't rule. God rules. Amen. This world belongs to him. So I'm going to uh, cut off their judge right out of the right in the midst, right right in the middle of his reigning, uh, his decision making. I'm going to just cut him off, and I'm going to slay all the princes. Princes, they're over segments of the kingdom. See, princes are over segments, like Daniel's over the third. King, the king was going to make him ruler over everything, but it finally it's such a outcry just over a third. The princes are over a section. See Satan has lieutenants that are over sections of his kingdom. I wouldn't doubt that there's some that are over like the lust of the flesh, another over the lust of the eye, another over the pride of life, and on and on. It's just like that. But see when God brings Satan down, he brings down his lieutenants and every every level of hierarchy is brought down with him. So I'll slay all their princes. The kingdom is a whole and every individual part. Now it's the same with establishing the church. The church as a whole is established at every individual part. See, it works for strength the other way when it's working about God's people. He builds up the leaders and each individual part and every individual region. He stands as a whole with all the parts. that You can't have a, a strong body and weak segments. <laughs> this isn't the way it works. But even if the wicked have a strong body and strong parts, he brings the body down and brings the parts down to him. Slay all their princes. You see how extensive his judgment was in these pronouncements against Damascus, Gaza, Tyrus, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. They brought down princes and underrulers. These, these kingdoms stood for the Syrians, Philistines, Phoenicians, Edomites, Ammonites, Moabites. The leaders are brought down. All the under leaders are brought down. Every region was brought down. Every individual. Brought. See, it's, it's so thorough. Amen. Now, this is what God has done to Satan's kingdom, brethren. Yeah. Right. He's decimated Satan's kingdom. But uh, some people know it and some people don't. Here is the ark full of God and of his people. He appeared to have been invincible for 4,000 years. He appeared to be, have been invincible. He appeared to have the control of the people of God and everything. Jesus comes and when he was crucified, a death blow was delivered to the head of Satan, to the heads of all his lieutenants, to the heads of all the regions, mm -hmm. down to the individual demons. Yeah. They all suffered the overthrow. Amen. That's right. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. He's the captain of our salvation, has dismantled Satan's kingdom. Amen. That's why you can have victory. Yes. It isn't because you are so strong of yourself. Mm -hmm. That isn't why. It's because his kingdom has been dismantled. Now you can deal with it. Amen. Amen. Satan lost his power in the heavenly realms mm -hmm. where you've been seated. Amen. He's not where you have been seated. Mm -hmm. He's been thrown out of there. Yes. When the intercessor went out, went in, the accuser went out. 
And when he went out, all of his henchmen went out with him. Or all of his angels, you might say. Devil and his angels were cast out of heaven. Now the least of all saints can successfully resist him. See? And realize the victory. So Amos's message foreshadowed this. Yeah. It was a picture of it. Yes, Judah. Yes, yes. What you're speaking of, that when the intercessor went in, the accuser went out. Thought even today in the atmosphere there's a place high enough where you can get that the air is so thin you can't breathe it. Humans, the flesh, can't breathe it. But the birds who can get that high can breathe it. They can breathe it freely so they can get up on a higher level than most other creatures can't. And that's what God's given us the ability to do. He said in Isaiah 40, 31, you shall mount up with wings yeah. as eagles and we can breathe where the devil can't. That's right. Uh -huh. he, he can't thrive where we've been given dominion. Now, again, you've got to be able to handle this. So if you're in the losing posture, it seems like you're being overthrown. You're too low. Yeah. Amen. That's what the trouble is. Amen. You're not living high enough. Yes. Amen. You're not in the spirit enough. Right. You're not living by faith enough. You're in the low zone where the enemy has not been cast out. Now that's one of the chief advantages of an assembly and purposes of an assembly yeah. to assist one another to break through the ozone, yeah. to break through the no zone and get up in here into the heavenlies where Satan just can't operate up here. Right. Now sometimes <clears throat> we'll have an assembly and there's so much things being revealed and made known it almost makes your head swim. Just one thing after another and you're seeing it and it's opening up and what's happened? You're up high. That's what's happened. You're up high up here where Satan's been cast out. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're able to see this, but it, it's kind of growing on me. I, I, I like to think about this. <laughs> Any of you have a word you'd like to say before we close? Silas? You said our works have a calculating effect on God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to keep in mind that He's judging He's in nations mm -hmm. right now. So if He's sensitive to it in the He's in nations, then He will probably be even more sensitive to it in His own people. Yeah. Amen. 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 See, God says to people, well done. Yeah. I, I know this isn't central in what you're talking about, but even animals have a certain habitat, and, and the only yeah. way to thrive is you got to stay where the habitat That's right. is. You know, mm -hmm. fish can't live on land, and and land animals can't thrive in the middle of the ocean. It can't happen. You got to stay where God puts you. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, uh, you know, we learned that lesson from Jude of angels that left their first left story, it. You yeah. know, yeah. so it's critical that we stay where God put us. In the heavenly places. Amen. 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 Yes, Brother Brett. I really appreciate the way you began the message tonight um, with making declarations about is it true or is it not true that we should fear God? Is what Jesus said right? Is it applicable? <laughs> and I've heard firsthand just recently messages that this flies in the face of. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about different things and how it compares with what you've said tonight. And if the message is that God loves you regardless of what you're doing, yeah. it's easy to say, well, people mean well. But what you, what you said that really, ultimately, we don't have control over ourselves. Another entity has control over us, really. That's right. And so I would say that people who are proclaiming that type of message do not mean well because they are being controlled right. by Amen. a force that is greater than themselves and intends to do great harm. Amen. And I also am thankful that you 
spoke so clearly about the subject of cremation. Mm -hmm. I have had a deep aversion to that from the time I was very young, hearing different people talk about it. I can think of someone here in Joplin who was quite prominent, who I think chose to be cremated as yeah. kind of taking a he stand. Did. Yeah. Well, and at least his family I did. had a, 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 a I, it didn't sit well with me. It never yeah. has. Amen. So I'm, I'm thankful to hear you say those things. Amen. 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 If we're underwater, we can't breathe. If you stay underwater too long, you will die. So it's like if you are under Satan too long, you will die in faith. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yeah, the only connection I could make was that the heathen kings burned their dead. I wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. God, all of God's people were buried yeah. in the scriptures. I mean. yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, the point is, yeah, there isn't a lot of evidence that the heathen kings did burn their, uh -huh. burn their kings because they dug up the bones to eat them. <laughs> yeah. All right, very good. We'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee <coughs> for the prophecy of Amos. We thank Thee, Lord, that he was faithful to his calling even though he prophesied under very difficult circumstances. And we want to follow in his train. In Jesus' name, amen.